So Ableton Live 12 has just been announced and I've had the pleasure of playing around with it for a few weeks now. And what I wanna do in this video is give you an overview of some of the new additions, changes, and share with you some of my new favorite features in this new version of Ableton Live. Also a quick shout out that I just released an online course, which is all about the fundamentals of creating your very own music using Ableton Live. If you're interested in that, I'll make sure to leave a link down below as well. And that course will be updated with the new Live 12 features early next year when Ableton Live 12 officially drops. So so before we jump in, it is worth noting that this is a beta version of the software. So there will probably be some changes and tweaks in between this version and the official released version, which will release sometime in early 2024. With that out of the way, let's take a look at some of the new features and additions in Ableton Live 12. So the first thing you'll probably notice if you're used to using older versions of Ableton Live is changes to the user interface here. I'll throw a comparison up on screen between Ableton Live 12 and Ableton Live 11, but you'll notice things are missing like the section fold and unfold buttons in all of the different corners. In fact, they have now been switched to different kind of buttons up here in the left for our browser. This is now a tuning and a groove pool, which we'll look at later on. Over on the top right, we now have our switching between session and arrangement view. Our bottom right down here has all of the mixer show and hide options and our info view is now this little I button in the bottom left. You also notice a few changes to the session view mixer. Down the bottom of the mixer, we have actually the track colors now, which wasn't there before. And there are some changes to the meters and how they look here. You'll notice that negative infinity is now actually an infinity symbol as opposed to negative I and F. And the track fader has changed here. So the arrow is now on the left-hand side as opposed to the right-hand side. And I've just dragged in a little bit of a break sample here to also show you the new meters in action, which we can now make full height basically, if we want to. And let's just turn this down a little bit. And you'll see that if I play this, the meters look slightly different. If I increase the level of this, so it's right near the top, you'll see that we now have it approaching red as it approaches zero, instead of as it goes above zero. The meters are also much faster, which I actually kind of like. You'll also notice some changes to the browser as well, namely up the top left, we have a little back and forward button. And we also have this filters option here, which we'll talk about in a second and some additional changes to the library, but mainly just kind of visually how it looks is a little bit different. But probably the most noticeable thing about the UI and kind of user interface is that now we can have stacked views. So for instance, if I switch to our arrangement view with the tab key, we can actually now view our mixer as well at the same time as the arrangement view. If I close up the browser here, I can come down to the bottom right and show the mixer. And now I can see the mixer at the same time as the arrangement view, which is something that is kind of been long coming, um, but it's really cool. Now, not only this, but if I say drag a drift instrument onto this first MIDI track here, we can see our device view and we can also see our device view and clip view at the same time using these stacked views as well. So if I create a MIDI clip here by right clicking and going inserting a new MIDI clip, here's our clip view. And now I can also, if I go down the bottom, see our device view. And if I want, I can also see the mixer view as well. So we have these stacked views. I can see our device view, clip view, mixer view, and arrangement view all in the one window. And of course the browser, if you wanted as well. Um, and you also see some changes to the clip view here, which we'll cover in a second. Now, speaking of the clip view, let's open this up and expand it completely. And you'll see some visual changes to the user interface of the clip view too. First of all, all our automation or modulation for our clip is now up the top. We can see notes, envelopes and MPE in our MIDI clips. And then if I take a look at the audio clip, we can see sample and envelopes here up the top now with all of the automation lanes and modulation lanes being chosen down from the bottom of the clip here instead of from the left where they were chosen previously. In the audio clips, you can also see the gain Control has a little bit of a revamp. And in the MIDI clips, which we'll go over when we actually look at some MIDI editing functions, you'll see there's this kind of new section here or some additions here, which uh, is something that we'll go over in a little bit. Next up, let's quickly go over some of the new and updated devices in Ableton Live 12. Starting with the only visual update that I could find in an audio effect is the multiband dynamics effect, which I actually really like. We can see here that now all of our different bands have colored numbers and we don't have to kind of switch between the threshold and timing views. Instead, we can now see them all at once without having to only view one at a time. It's a tiny, tiny little improvement, but it's actually a really high quality of life one for me who uses 
multiband dynamics a fair bit. Now, where we actually get a lot of updated devices is in the MIDI effects section. So here you'll see all of the updated MIDI effects. We have the arpeggiator, which has its UI slightly updated. We have the chord, which has its UI slightly updated with some additional parameters, such as the strum parameter, which allows us to kind of offset each of the different MIDI note additions. We have the pitch MIDI effect, which has been changed slightly as well with a bit of a UI update with this big pitch control in the center here. And also some new modes down the bottom, block, fold, and limit, which are pretty cool as well. Maybe I'll do a whole video kind of going through this new pitch MIDI effect. And the scale device has just had a slight UI update as well. And it now also includes the ability to choose a scale directly within the device itself, which is much more useful than it was before. There have also been some updates to the Max for Live modulators, such as the Envelope Follower, LFO, Shaper, etc. And these now all have the ability to modulate parameters instead of take them over like they did previously. Let me show you what I mean. So here we now have a new modulators section in our library, which contains Envelope Follower, Envelope MIDI, Expression Control, LFO, Shaper, and Shaper MIDI. So for example, here I have this break, and this is running through an auto filter. Now, previously, if I were to add an LFO to this and I mapped this to the filter frequency, it would overtake the filter frequency control, meaning that I couldn't manually move this filter frequency if I wanted to, and I have to kind of adjust it using the rate controls of the LFO. But now we have the ability to switch it to mod mode, which is actually what it's in by default. And you'll see now, if I look at the frequency control of our auto filter, we still get the ability to actually manually move this control. And this LFO is just modulating the position of it in the same way that modulation works in a clip. So I can now adjust the rate, change all these controls here. And I now get the ability to adjust the filter frequency manually on the auto filter device itself. And this works for all of the different modulation devices, including envelope follower, envelope MIDI, expression control, shaper, and shaper MIDI as well. Super useful feature. Now, no, it doesn't do per note modulation like something like Bitwig. Maybe that's something they'll be able to figure out in the future, but I doubt it with the way that it's implemented in the software. Fingers crossed though. Lastly, let's check out some of the new devices in Ableton Live 12. First, we have one new instrument called Mel. This is an interesting little synthesizer that basically is a bi timbral synthesizer with some really interesting oscillators. As a synthesizer, it's actually quite simple. We don't get any kind of routing options yet. Hopefully we get some more routing options. It's just this A oscillator has a bunch of envelopes and LFOs, goes straight into a filter, straight into an amplifier. Same with this B oscillator here. But what each of these oscillators do have is some really interesting and unique oscillator shapes and types. For instance, let's turn off oscillator B and take a look at this oscillator drop down menu on oscillator A. And we can see a whole bunch of interesting different oscillator types here, all from just basic simple shapes, for instance, basic shapes. All the way down to things like tarp. And even things like rain and crackle and bubbles are pretty cool one as well, actually. And you notice that all of these oscillators have these two macro controls here, which actually change their function depending on the oscillator shape and type that you've chosen. From a kind of synthesis nerd perspective, it's actually a fairly simple synthesizer, but what really makes it interesting and different are these oscillator shapes and types. I don't know if it's enough for me to kind of want to use it that much, but it's an interesting synth. However, the next new device that I am really interested in is a new audio effect called RAW. So this is RAW, and RAW is basically a multi-stage distortion that is similar to something like maybe Rift or Outputs Thermal or something along those lines. Now you'll see here that just by default, we have this as one stage, but we can go and change our routing option here to maybe something like multiband. And now we get a different distortion stage for the lows, mids, and highs. And you'll see there's a few different routing options as well, but not only are there routing options, there are also modulation options. I can go to the expanded view here and you can see we've got a whole modulation matrix 
two LFOs, an envelope follower, and a noise modulator to allow us to modulate a bunch of these different parameters here. Let's close this up and we can also see that we have a feedback mode similar to something like Minimal Audio's Rift plugin, which we can switch between time, sync, triplet, dotted, and note. We also have a kind of one knob compression here, and of course an output and dry wet control. Now what is also really cool about Roar is that it has some new interesting transfer curves. So if I go down to the shaper, we can see soft sign, digital clip, bit crusher, diode clipper, tube preamp, etc., etc. And these are all really interesting things like noise injection and shards are all pretty wild actually. And there's also some interesting filters as well. So not only do we have a low pass, band pass, high pass, we also have things like notch and we also have a peak EQ, which is quite cool. And then there's also things like a morph filter, a comb filter, and also a resampling filter. And by using all of these in conjunction, you can get some really, really gnarly sounds. I'll probably do a whole video on RAW, but let's just show some kind of quick audio examples. I'll probably end up doing a whole video on RAW because I actually really love it, but I might wait to see if it gets updated with any more new features before I go down that road. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss that video. All right, two other new devices that I just want to talk about really briefly. The first one is CC control as a MIDI effect. This is a really cool MIDI effect that allows you to send CC MIDI control like mod wheel, pitch bend, pressure, and any custom MIDI CCs using a MIDI effect instead of MIDI modulation inside of a MIDI clip, which is super useful. And last but not at least one of the most popular Ableton Live Max for Live devices, Granulator 2 has received an update to Granulator 3, which has some new quality of life features. I didn't use Granulator 2 a huge amount, but let's just take a look at some of the Granulator 3 presets. Of course, like pretty much everything else in Ableton Live, Granulator now has MPE and there's a bunch of additional things here. And of course, just a UI update, which makes it a much more user-friendly plugin and device in my eyes. Again, I'll probably do a whole video on this when and if it gets a little bit more updated closer to the release. Next up, we have MIDI editing and MIDI editing in Ableton Live has got a bunch of new quality of life improvements. Not that it was bad before, but it was very limited. And now there's a lot more new features probably more than you thought were coming. And uh, I just want to run you through a few of them really quickly. Okay, so here is a blank new MIDI clip. And first of all, let's talk about some just basic MIDI editing tweaks. If I add in a MIDI note here, and let's just extend this all the way through to the length of the end of the bar, there's a new option to split notes. So for example, if I want to split this one long note into 16th notes, I can just press Command and E, and that will split it into the current grid size. If I change my grid size to quarter notes, Command and E, it's going to split it into quarter notes now. If I want to split this note at any point along the note, I can just hold down the E key and I can just click and split this note wherever. Or if I want to kind of split any of these notes into a select number of equally spaced divisions, I can just select this, hold down the option or alt and E key and just click or drag up or down to create a bunch of divisions of this note. And then I can actually select all of these notes, press command and J and that will join them all back together. There's a few other options. For example, we have here a fit to time range, which is pretty cool. For example, if I select this note and then select the entirety of the clip, I can right click and go to fit to time range. And that's just going to extend that note to the length of time that I've selected. So if I select a bit of a less amount of time here, let's say I 
do that and select this length of time. I can go Option, Command, and J, and that will select that to that length of time. Next up, there's a bunch of changes to the kind of typical utility editing section here. So for instance, let's just create a really simple just pattern. Let's just click around some areas here. For instance, I can now select all of these and I've got the option up here to fit to scale, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit more, but in the same way that in Live 11, we had options for like adding scales to clips. We now can fit notes to a scale if the notes are outside of it. See, for example, here, these two notes are outside of our currently highlighted scale. If I select all of these notes and click the fit to scale option, those are now going to jump to one of the notes or the nearest note in the scale. There's an option to add intervals on top of notes. So for example, if I select all of these and I wanna add a fifth above these, I can actually add an interval here, which is currently set to SD. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but if I increase this a little bit, you'll see that we've now added some intervals above all of those notes. We also have the ability here to, again, select all of these notes. And instead of just multiplying or dividing by two in terms of their length, we can stretch it to any kind of division or multiple all the way down to divided by 10 or times by 10, which is pretty cool. We also have the ability to set the length of a note to a specific length. For example, if I want to set all of these to say 16th notes, I can select 16th notes, select the length, or I could set them all to quarter notes, or I could set them all to 128th notes. That's pretty cool. And let's just select all of these and again, just create a kind of interesting clip here, just with a kind of constant quarter note pattern, we also get the ability now to humanize these notes. And what humanizing does is basically just offset them slightly timing wise. So if I select all of these, I can go to the humanize option. I can increase this percentage and you'll see as I do that, they're all just getting their timings kind of adjusted here in kind of somewhat of a random way, which is pretty cool and useful. You can also just set this and then of course click the humanize button and that will just continuously humanize these notes for you. And the reverse and legato buttons are of course still there. The duplicate button, however, has been moved over to this clip edit window on the left instead of in this main kind of editing window utilities function window here. But probably the most exciting and interesting feature about MIDI editing in Live 12 are MIDI generators and MIDI transform tools. So you can see here in this same little window, we have these two other options. We have transformation tools and generate tools. Generate tools allow us to, you guessed it, generate a MIDI pattern. We have things like rhythm, seed, shape, and stacks. So for instance, I could generate a chord progression if I click on stacks. We can add in a few chords here. Let's generate a four chord progression. I could maybe change some of these chords to different chord shapes or inversions. And I could maybe change the root keys of these, which is pretty interesting. And we now have a really simple chord progression. It's just a sawtooth wave at the moment, so it's gonna sound pretty weird, but. It's not using any kind of AI or interesting movement or anything like that. There's still a lot of manual labor that goes into this, but it's really useful. However, let's just delete all of those, go here and let's try out the seed option, which just will generate basically a random MIDI pattern for you within a certain set of parameters, which uh, is really, really interesting. So there's a few MIDI generators that come by default with Ableton Live 12, and there's also transform tools. Now, as the generator tools kind of generate new MIDI patterns, transform tools transform existing MIDI patterns. And we've got things like arpeggiate, connecting, ornamenting, quantizing, recombining, spanning, strumming, time warping. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. But for example, if I just delete all of these, let's go ahead and generate a stacks, which is our chord progression here. Let's click on this generate button to generate a tool. Let's go back to our transform tool and we could now arpeggiate these. Or I could undo all of that and we could say strum these notes instead. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff we can do here as well. Again, I'll probably do a whole video going through the different generators and transform tools, probably closer to the release date in case we get any more of them or there's some updates to these as well. But one interesting thing to note about the generator and transform tools is they are actually 
actually built in Max for Live. So people can create their own generator or MIDI transform tools and we can actually use them in our session. So we might yet see some potentially like machine learning stuff or maybe some interesting other things in here. There's a whole wide world of possibilities open up with these new tools. So kind of following on from MIDI editing and MIDI clips and stuff, there is a whole new interesting feature in Live 12, which is called scale awareness, which is really interesting in terms of how it works and it probably warrants a whole video, but let me just kind of go through it a little bit briefly. So here up the top of our Ableton Live session, you'll see this new section, which is our kind of scale section. Here we can set a kind of global scale kind of for our session. So I could say work in E minor. And now the really interesting part comes about. For example, if I now add an arpeggiator tool, we can now have this arpeggiator tool locked to the scale either of our session or of a MIDI clip. Sessions and MIDI clips can kind of have their own independent scales. Again, kind of interesting, but we'll talk about that in a future video. So for instance, let's just create a basic chord here. I'm just gonna create, let's instead of creating a, an E minor chord, let's create a, actually no, let's create an E minor chord, right? So I'm just gonna do this. Let's create a really basic E minor chord. And you can see here that this scale or the scale in this MIDI clip is actually already highlighted and it's set to E minor. So now if I arpeggiate this pattern, it's just gonna arpeggiate it normally. If I go in here and maybe change this G to a G sharp, Pretty cool, but now if I switch on the scale awareness of the arpeggiator, it's now going to lock in those notes to the scale of the MIDI clip. And if I change the scale of the MIDI clip, let's for instance change this now to a G, uh, I don't know, this one. And actually let's go to D sharp instead. Now it's again gonna lock that to the scale. And now also what's cool about this is anywhere where there was like semitone distances inside of arpeggiator, you'll see that now it says SD instead, which stands for scale degrees. So if I now increase this steps here, instead of this jumping up by 12 semitones like our arpeggiator normally does, it's jumping up by 12 scale degrees. So everything is locked to the chosen scale for this clip. And any device that you see the scale awareness button on can be locked to the scale for the currently playing MIDI clip. And this scale awareness also works, of course, for the MIDI generator and transform tools, which is super, super useful. It even works with the new meld instrument. If we take a look at meld, we can see right up the top, we have this use current scale option. And this is particularly useful for any of the oscillator types if we select one of these oscillators from the list that has that little scale option next to it. For example, the Swarm Saw, let's turn off the arpeggiator here and play a note. Increase the spacing, it's gonna detune them. And if I turn on scale awareness, it will lock each of those detuned notes to our currently playing or selected scale. Again, nuts. Really interesting. Building on from this, there's actually a whole new tuning system as well, which allows us to change the tuning of our entire set to something that is non 12 tone equal temperament, which for those of you who are actually interested in this kind of stuff, that's mind blowing. For instance, here, let's actually just generate some kind of a really simple pattern. Let's just go into here and let's just generate something with our shape. Uh, rather, let's go to our seed control and generate a really interesting basic MIDI pad. Let's switch our oscillator type back to something really basic and turn off scale awareness for meld. And you'll see here, if I go to my browser in the tuning section, we have a whole bunch of Scala or tuning files that allow us to change the tuning of our entire set. So I could now work in 72 equal divisions per octave, for instance. And that will change our MIDI clips as well. And we can see here's C4, and then we have 72 divisions of that octave. Or you could work in a little bit more kind of typical things maybe, maybe some less kind of uh, Western scales. 
And this will update every single MIDI clip in your session, except for, of course, like drum rack MIDI clips and stuff, only the pitched MIDI clips. Now it's worth noting that this kind of tuning thing only actually works in MPE capable instruments. So if you're using a non MPE capable instrument, it won't work, unfortunately. Lastly, the browser has had a significant overhaul in terms of adding a tagging and filtering system. So if we take a look over at the browser, you will probably notice up the top there is this new filters option. And if we unfold this filters section, you'll see here that there are a whole bunch of options that we can use to filter anything that we have in our library. For instance, if I was looking for some kind of kick drum, I could search for kick and now I could have in all of my library, open up my filters and I could search specifically for kick drums and maybe I could do kick loops or something like that. And maybe I could find samples. Now, of course you have to have actually tagged these beforehand though. So in order to tag a file, all we need to do is actually just find that file in our browser. Say I wanted to tag like these kick drums, for instance, I could select all of these edit them, and now I can just tag these with whatever I wanted to. And then theoretically, those would show up when I kind of searched for those particular tags using the filter option in whichever section that I was in, in my browser. There's also some other changes to the browser. For instance, we can now actually go back in search history, which is kind of cool, or throughout the history of our browser. And we can also save certain searches to access in our browser really quickly. So for instance, if I wanted to search, like again, search for kick and I could search my library for all. And now I could add some filters. Let's go to kick and let's go to sample. And now if I come down to this results here and click on this little add button, that's gonna add a category to my sample that is that search result. Now, to be perfectly honest, I'm actually not the biggest fan of these browser improvements. Uh, I can see why some people would like them, but to me, I've already gone through and kind of curated all of my samples and presets and stuff. And what I have noticed is that now our audio effects no longer have all of these folders and neither do plugins have all of the folders. Now, maybe that'll change in between this beta version and the release version, uh, but that is of course yet to be seen. However, one new aspect of the browser that I do really find interesting is a similarity swap slash search. And what this does is basically searches your entire library for things that sound similar to whatever sound you have selected. So for instance, let's go to a drum sound here and find a kit. Here's a whole kit, an acoustified kit. And you'll see when I have this clicked, we have this little option on the right hand, which says show similar files. If I click on this, that's gonna give us all of the similar files to that by sound, not necessarily by name or anything. And if we turn on our browser file preview again. And this works for pretty much anything that has some kind of audio preview, which is really cool. And not only that, it actually works inside of drum racks as well. So for instance, if I added this drum rack to a track, we can see here now in this drum rack, we have this similarity swap button up the top right hand corner. If I click on this, we now have the ability to similarity swap individual samples or the entirety of a kit as a whole. So for instance, here we have a kick drum. If I wanted to swap this for a similar one, I could just browse to the next one and the next one and the next one. Or if I wanted to similarity swap the whole kit, I could just bam, take them all over to the right. If I wanted to lock certain presets or certain pads from switching, say I didn't want to switch these ones on my kick drum, I could then again move to the next similar samples and that's changed the whole kit except for the pads I've locked. And I can turn off similarity swap and I've got a whole new drum kit that sounds similar to the drum kit I had originally just using other samples in my library. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, I'd love to invite you to leave a like down below, subscribe if you're new. And if you're really enjoying this video, why not consider supporting me over on my Buy Me A Coffee page where you can support me by buying me a coffee, downloading some cool stuff from my store or becoming a member to support me on a monthly basis. As I mentioned at the start of this video, I've also released an online course. You can check out links for both of those things down below. And of course, if you're interested in seeing more Live 12 content, make sure to subscribe. There are some other minor tweaks and improvements to Live 12. One of the really big ones that I think is massive that's quite overlooked actually is some of the audio clip automation slash modulation options. For instance, here in this break clip, 
you'll see that if I go down to my envelopes in the clip, I now actually get the ability to automate the transient envelope for the beats warp mode or modulate it, which is gnarly cool. People have been asking me for this forever. So if I now have this on the beat transient warp mode, and I can set this to the forwards mode and now I can modulate this little envelope parameter right here, which is sick. Wicked. There's also an option in the right click menu for the clip here for normalizing the clip sample, which is fairly useful. And you'll also notice in this same right click menu that some of these options have changed their names a little bit. There's also the option in the clip view to use the Z and H keys to kind of zoom in and out and fit to width and height and all that kind of stuff that you'd find in the arrangement view. And speaking of the arrangement view, there's also an option to adjust the waveform height of audio clips, waveform zoom, if you will, which is a feature that is pretty common in a lot of other digital audio workstations. There's some visual adjustments to the preferences window. There's the ability to group certain notes in MIDI clips with regards to their chance or probability and either have the entire group have a certain probability or just individual notes within that group have certain probability. And the quantize view for both audio clips and MIDI clips has now been moved over to the kind of clip inspector panel as opposed to popping up as a separate window. Now, of course, there's probably going to be some other things that are going to be added in between now and the actual release. There's probably going to be some things that will change and I don't know, maybe some things that will go back to the way they were. Who knows? There's a bunch of time between now and the actual release date. But overall, my thoughts on Live 12 are that it's a pretty massive update with some really good and interesting updates, particularly for composing music and being creative with musical ideas. Some of the new device additions are also really interesting. For instance, I love RAW. I think it's probably one of my new favorite devices inside of Ableton Live, or at least will quickly become, especially with some minor tweaks and updates. And the improved MIDI editing and generator and transform tools are really, really cool. And they're kind of things I've seen in other doors, but I think they're implemented really well in Live 12. And the fact that they're max for live is also just a huge step up, which means that anyone can basically create their own MIDI generator or transform tools. I also really like the ability to have stacked views and of course have the mixer meter go all the way up to full height. But there are some changes that I'm not particularly too fond of. As I mentioned, the new browser functionality is a little bit hit and miss for me and it's a little bit hard to get used to, but that could just be me. I'm so used to how a Ableton Live's browser worked in the past, and I know that uh, probably a lot of people are going to be really liking this new update to the browser. There are also some additions and changes that have made Live a little bit more cumbersome to get around in my opinion. For instance, things like changes to keyboard shortcuts and things like that. And all these additional options are cluttering up things a little bit, but I think it's for the better. However, with regards to keyboard shortcuts and navigation, I personally think something like a proper keyboard shortcut editor would be really, really good now with all of these additional keyboard shortcuts and controls in Ableton Live 12. I'd also really love to see implementation of things that people have been asking for for a while. Things such as ARA2 support or clip gain editing in the arrangement view, for instance. Proper multi-channel support would be interesting to see as well, although these are kind of fairly niche features. However, it would be nice to see Live implement them in order to kind of keep up with other digital audio workstations. I also feel like this is a bit of a missed opportunity to maybe add some more effects, things like maybe a, I don't know, an auto tune or something like that. And to also maybe update some of the older audio effects, which I think could probably use some updates here and there. And as much as I love raw and meld, I still think there's a bunch of tweaks that could be done to improve these between now and release. Now, maybe I'm asking a little bit too much. Don't get me wrong. I think this is a really fantastic update, but I feel that there are a bunch of features that could have just been added to Live 11 and kind of not pushed with this new update. I don't feel like Live 11 really got a proper life cycle and it would have been nice to see a lot of these features or a few of these features brought into Live 11 instead of kind of held for Live 12 and maybe extend out the life cycle of Live 11 for another few years. Now, of course, there are probably some behind the scenes issues with implementing some of these things into Live 11, like the scale awareness, for instance, um, but maybe some of the additional devices and stuff could be things that were put into Live 11 instead of 
saved for Live 12. Anyway, there is an overview of pretty much all of the new features in Ableton Live 12 as of the announcement in November of 2023. And just a reminder that the software I showed you in this video is still in beta, so there's bound to be a whole bunch of changes and improvements, additions in between now and the official release in early 2024. Also, I'm sure the public beta will open up soon if it's not already. There'll be probably details for how to access that through the Ableton website. So if you have feature suggestions, requests, things like that, make sure to jump on the public beta when you're able to and add them to the forum. I'll also be doing more in-depth videos covering some of my favorite features of Ableton Live 12, so make sure to subscribe to stay tuned for them. Otherwise, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. Make sure to check out this video right here for some more Ableton Live tutorials and goodies, and I'll see you all in the next video.